This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Two, one, bingo. <laughs> <laughs> We're back. Four o'clock, our flagship energy show. I love energy. We should all love energy. It's like clean nourishment. Energy. Clean, clean energy. energy. That voice over there is Sharon Moriwaki. <laughs> She's the co-host and co-chair of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, and she loves energy. Uh, and uh, to, my, to my left is uh, Shannon Tangadon. She's from Hawaiian Electric. She is a spokeswoman from Hawaiian Electric. Thank you for having We're me. We'll talk about uh, the Hawaiian Electric port, if you will. Okay, and Jeff Ono, former consumer advocate and now in private practice, as an energy attorney, is that a fair statement? That's fair. All right, so nice to have you Our here. Our special guest today. <laughs> special <laughs> guest, yeah. So, but first we have to have the wine electric report, okay? Sure. So, <clears throat> first thing I want to ask you about is grid modernization, okay? What is it and where are we? Well, our grid modernization strategy was approved by the PUC last week, so we're very excited about that. I can see the champagne bottles. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was, yes, it was <laughs> lots of Eve. celebrating going on. So that entails our, our near-term plans for updating the grid, making it more resilient, more renewable-ready. So what we have is a six-year plan um, that includes everything from, you know, strategically placing um, advanced inverters, uh, smart meters. Um, it's just an array of technology. A cornucopia. Yeah, a cornucopia of technology. <laughs> good good here, word, good that. word. And, and what we're, we're trying to do is, you know, update the grid, make it renewable ready, make sure that we have everything in place so that you know, the grid really was meant for one-way flow, you know, energy yeah, going out, yeah, yeah. not this two-way flow that we have now with all this rooftop solar. So we really just need to update the grid, make sure that it's, you know, ready to take on more renewables. Yeah, this is very important. And um, so when can we see signs of this? Um, what, you say six years? What happened first? Yeah. What happens first in well, the six first, years? Well, first, well... Um, at first, we really just need to um, get our, um, our planning, our implement, implementation plan in place, and that needs to be um, given to the PUC by March 1st. And so we have that deadline, and so that kind of gives, you know, our step-by-step, -step, uh, you know. Okay. Yeah. Well, March 1st is coming right it's along. It's coming it's right up. Away. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot going on. And so, then, what did they, so what did they approve, Shannon, if the plan comes in March 1st? What was approved? The just overall strategy, just like strategy. these are the steps, and you know, these, this is the type of technology that we're going to be using, you know, advanced inverters, you know, we're going to be, the communications updates and stuff, so it's, everything comes together and it's sort of a, a road map, so the implementation part comes next, you know, where we have more specific information, timelines, mm -hmm. you know, costs. Mm -hmm. yeah. And who's going to do what, when. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly, and how it will work for all the companies. Very exciting. It is very because exciting. Because in order to move ahead with all this and, you know, reach the, the deadline and all that, the 100%, we have to do this, right? Definitely. This is an absolute requirement to it do that. It is definitely necessary. You yeah. know, our grids need to be updated. How's sure. it going to change your life, Shannon? How will it change mine? <laughs> well, I'll just have more to talk about as far as technology. Exactly my I need to really read up on so all the technology. So you have to come back and exactly. give us reports from time to time exactly. about how it's doing. Yes, <laughs> yes. You have to start with, you know, when they approve the, the, the plan that you, the implementation plan you're exactly. submitting on March 1st. Yeah. Okay. So then we got RPS. What's happening with RPS? Renewable Portfolio Standards. See, I know what it means. <laughs> Well, we're excited. We, it moved up. It bumped up from 26% in 2016 to 27% um, in 2017. Renewables overall. Renewables out of overall. Okay. Exactly. And so. And that's for the three islands. You, I mean, the three counties. That's, yeah, the it's a consolidated. Yeah. For um, Hawaii Island, it went up 3% to 57%. Wow. Um, Maui dipped a little, but that was because there was less wind energy being sent to the grid. You mean? Yeah. 
we took 95% of what was available, but um, it, it, you know. So the wind uh, what you're saying is the wind. curtailment was only 5%? Yes. Is that yeah. <clears throat> so, um, but Maui does have a fair amount of wind, though. In fact, uh, Hawaii probably has, am I right about this? It has as much wind as any island does. Huh? Yeah. It's yes, strong it's, on wind. I mean, Kauai, exactly. yesterday David Bissell at the, the Harbor Club, he said, we're not doing wind. They cannot. Zero, okay. zero wind in, in Kauai. They yeah. the, They're concerned about the bird, bird, bird kill. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. And, and the way the, mm. the ecology is set up in Kauai, the birds are a concern. Mm -hmm. But uh, Ulupalakua is a big thing, right? Yes. In West yes. Maui, you mm -hmm. got a lot of wind there. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just that there was less wind overall. You last mean, year. As a phenomenon as in the a weather. As a phenomenon, yes, last wow. year in the weather. I wonder if that's related to climate change or maybe El Nino? I'm yeah, not sure. El Nino. We're going to find yeah, out. Yeah, we'll find out. We'll find that's out for next, se you know, yeah. next episode. <laughs> yeah, well, next episode. I mean, El Nino is this year, you know, so yeah. you great, expect great. surprises yes, on that exactly. kind of thing. Okay, and what else? What did it find for, uh, I don't know, did we cover all the islands? Yeah. Oh, or Oahu, Oahu yeah. 19%. Um, in 2016, we went up to 21% okay. in 2017. Sounds like we're on the track here. We then. are on the track. And, you know, it, we're excited because we have a lot more um, renewables, large-scale projects on the way. And then we also are implementing programs so that we have more private rooftop solar. So we're making our way, you know, forward. Yeah, I had, a, I had a show with Marco Mangelsdorf this morning, and we kind of agreed that you need both. You need utility scale mm -hmm. solar with storage, and you need private homes solar with storage. Mm -hmm. I mean, ultimately, <clears throat> you can't have just one, not the other. You've got to have both mm -hmm. for robust, resilient system. Yeah. Yes. Okay, and the third thing was the RFP business. I say business, I mean, I, you know, <laughs> request for proposals. Yeah, what do you got out there? What's coming back? Well, we're asking the commission to approve our re request for proposals. Um, we really need uh, 20, 220 megawatts for, of generation for Oahu. We want um, 60 megawatts for the island of Maui and 20 for the Hawaii Island. More than is now. More than is now. And by, this is all renewables we're talking about. All renewables, mm -hmm. and we're not specifying what type of renewable be anything be anything you come one come all yeah give us your tired huddled renewable <laughs> yeah. developers yeah. and we'll talk to them definitely <laughs> i think you know we just need to get started because if we want to reach these goals we really need to get this um proposal this process started so that you know we can get development going yeah this is a big leg up isn't it to have this much more renewables on those three Islands, yeah. Definitely, definitely. And, you know, we're moving forward. And I think, you know, it's just an exciting time to be at, at the utility. Yeah. Well, uh, on that very point, Molokai, the, the deal was made and uh, was it approved or? Yeah. In Molokai, the, um, um, I forget the name right now, um, um, oh. the solar yeah. battery. Solar, yeah, solar plus battery. Half moon. The Half Moon Project on Molokai. So that happened. That's actually going on. That is That going project on. is going forward. You know, that's great. It's great. So little by little. Yeah. Molokai is gone on its way, for sure. There's yeah. a lot of progress. Well, this will change progress. things. Because yes. right now, there's no, there's no utility solar there. It's just utility um, diesel. Mm -hmm. But there is a certain small amount of regular mm -hmm. You know, uh, photovoltaic there. Yes, yes. Um, this is going to change that picture. Definitely. It's going to be a significant amount of photovoltaic and, and storage. storage mm -hmm. yeah. And that's, that's what's happening, isn't it? That's the direction we're going. All this tells us it's photovoltaic and storage. Huh? Yes, for sure. You know, there was an article last week in the Wall Street Journal I was telling you that really was very interesting. Yeah. And uh, where Next Era, remember them? <laughs> Next Era is building these facilities in various cities on the mainland with like 100 megawatts at a time in solar mm. and, um, and storage. And, storage. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, we're not the only ones. Mm -hmm. We have to show them we're ahead, though. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> okay, what do you want to add? Then we're going to move on. What, was, what is your message today, Shannon? Our message today is, you know, really we're, we're marching forward. We're getting all these, um, all the pieces in place to get to 100% renewables. All right. Yeah. And we're watching it happen point yeah. by point. Questions? Very good.
No, Comments? I think that's great. <laughs> Jeff? Yep. No, I think that's a perfect segue into our discussion yes, right. on biofuels. With that in mind, we're going to take a short break. Thank you, Shannon, for Thank coming you. down. Thank you great for having time. me. Shannon uh, Tanganan of Hawaiian Electric, a spokesman. We're going to take a short break, and then we're going to go to our main case in chief uh, with Jeff Ono and Yay. Sharon Moriwaki. Looking we'll forward. Right back. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion, nothing is making sense for me and you. Maybe we can find a way, there's got to be solution, how to make a brighter day. I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. Every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m., I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science, where we'll dig into science, dig into the meat of science, dig into the joy and delight of science. We'll discover why science is indeed fun, why science is interesting, why people should care about science, and care about the research that's being done out there. It's all great, it's all entertaining, it's all educational, so I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science. Okay, we're back, we're live, and guess who? That's Sharon Mori Waki. Aloha. Co-host and co-chair of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, and Jeff Ono, a former consumer advocate and now a private practice attorney in energy. So nice to have you here. We're going to talk about bioenergy in Hawaii. What is the status of bioenergy in Hawaii anyway, Jeff? Well, you know, we're moving <laughs> along. So when okay, there you have it. <laughs> well, you know, and Shannon was here talking about uh, the increases in the, the renewable energy to the RPS and how much Hawaiian Electric is doing in renewable energy. But much of it is variable renewable energy. It's solar and wind. So those are not available um, on a you know, as needed mm -hmm. basis. It's, it's available when the sun is shining and when the wind is blowing. Except if I have storage. Storage is Storage key. will help. But if you have long periods of, of cloudy days. Not like today, mm. like for today, example. Yes. Or several days, then the batteries will discharge and there will be nothing to, to charge and them then again. Then you have nothing. Mm. So there's still variability okay. even if you add battery to, the, to, to solar yeah. you know, and solar farms. Yeah. Um, which, which brings us to this discussion on biofuel. Because biofuel can provide firm dispatchable energy to Hawaiian Electric or to our island grid. Um, and that's important for resilience, for reliability. The electric utilities need to be able to call on firm, firm power when, you know, when they need it. So the question really is, um, where does it fit? You know, imagine a landscape where you have certain kinds of demand here, this kind of thing, this kind of facility, property, whatever, company. And this kind over here, different, not the same. Um, where does the biofuel thing fit? For example, I know Hawaii, uh, Hawaii, uh, bi Hawaii, uh, 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 Joel's group. Uh, bio. Which one? The Hawaii Bioenergy? The, the yeah, yeah, Hawaii yeah. Bio it's Kelly King and all that. Oh, no, oh that's specific biodiesel. Specific biodiesel is, you know, they're servicing the airport, right? They got, they're providing biofuel to the airport, in, in the airport, for the airport functions, right? They got a contract for that. They have a contract for the emergency generator at the, at the yeah, airport. Yeah, yeah. And they've also signed agreements with Hawaiian Electric to provide, on a spot basis, uh, bio, biodiesel, biofuel uh, to be used at, you know, the, there's a new Schofield generating station that, that's being constructed right now. That's supposed to run on 50% biofuel. So Pacific Biodiesel is going to provide some, at least some of that, uh, some of that biofuel. Uh, so they're they're doing they're doing very well. But, mm -hmm. You know their feedstock is is generally made up of used cooking oil, and there's a limited supply of used cooking oil in in the state. This means we all have to go to the restaurants more often <laughs> and eat more. Eat more fried food. Deep fried food. Would deep be fried food. <laughs> French fries would be very good. Unless they tell you not to no, eat uh, anymore. Well, you know, think of your greater obligation here. <laughs> So, so why, but, but so why the point, is that the point kind I of made, need, Jeff, though? is that oh, okay. certain yeah. kinds of facilities and functions are better suited for biofuel. Am I right? I mean, what's the general rule on that? Well, at, 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 
Uh, today's technology, uh, yes. Certain you know, functions are better served with biofuel with, you know, or biomass to replace the, the current um, fossil fuel driven units that are, are, are on the system. I mean, that's the idea is, you know, because these functions are, are being served right now by fossil fuel driven plants. We're trying to replace those plants with renewable energy. But when you replace plants, these old steam generators, you lose a certain amount of reliability, resilience to the system because they provide certain functions that these variable uh, renewable energy sources so cannot provide. It's a provide. migration. It's kind of a migration. It, it's, well, it's part of moving toward 100%. Yeah. If we're going to move to 100% re renewable energy, we've got to get rid of the, the fossil fuel plants. Okay, and biofuel is not fossil fuel. Biofuel is biofuel. It's a renewable for sure. So looking down the pike, I know Sharon wants to ask you this question. No, no. Looking down the pike, at the hundred, the day of a hundred percent, you know, where there's really champagne, you know, and corks are popping and <laughs> confetti, whatnot. Um, how much of that is going to be biofuel? Well, if you look at Hawaiian Electric's power supply improvement plant, a fairly significant amount is going to be biofuel, but they're looking at it in terms of you know what technology is available today. You know, maybe in 10 years we're going to have hydrogen or some other source that can replace that. But for now, uh, the most, you know, in terms of technology, it's biofuel, biomass. So, so I want to go back to, to the theme of today's um, show, which is, you know, the regulatory scheme. And, and what, is that the reason why, if this is so important to have biofuels that we have so little locally produced? And, where is the hang up? What are the challenges? And, and what can we do to make more biofuels? <laughs> well, so let's talk about it. In, you know, when we talk about biofuel, there's two types. One is biomass, where you take a, a, a like plant, ma plant material. Yeah, or H power, something similar to that. You take a plant material and you put it into a boiler and um, you combust your plant material and it generates heat boils the water, creates steam, you pressurize the steam, it drives a turbine, mm -hmm. and you generate electricity. Like the facility on Kauai, which is right now that's doing pretty well. That the green energy... Using the Albizia. Right, the green energy facility is a seven megawatt plant on Kauai that uh, you know, is selling um, energy to KIUC through a power purchase agreement. Yeah. Uh, they are burning albizia, but they're eventually going to run out of albizia trees, and so they are looking at cultivating mm. eucalyptus and some other mm. other types of uh, you know mm. plant material mm. that they can mm. burn in that mm. in that furnace. That's a proven technology. It works. It's an old, I mean, yeah. you know, fifty hundred year old technology. All of the sugar mills used the to burn the gas, yeah. and they generated electricity to run their own sugar yeah. mill, and yeah. what excess they had, they sold to the electric utilities. Yeah. So it's, an, it's yeah. tried and true, yeah. that biomass technology is tried, but it's expensive to produce. It's still very expensive. Could it be cheaper? I mean, it, would technology make it cheaper? You know, there have been technology, um, you know, advances in terms of the, the boiler technology, some of the the control systems are much better than in the, the old days of the sugar mill. Um, but, you know, just the, the, the cost and the feedstock cost, it, right now a biomass plant is going to cost more to generate electricity than, a, than an oil-driven plant, mm. today's dollars. So aren't they going to be priced out as we go further toward 100%? I, no, I don't think so. I, you know, and I think part of it is that we are going to see oil prices rise. Um, you know, where it's going to be right now, I think, I checked today, oil is at $65 a going barrel. Up. Well, actually, it came down. It had hit $70, and it, it dropped back down. What's your prediction? I think it's going, to some, it's going to be somewhere around $70 to $80 over the next five years. Hmm. Um, you know, those who are in the know say that because of unconventional oil in, the, uh, in North America, oil prices won't go up uh, worldwide more than seventy eighty dollars what happens in 2020 when the uh, international um, maritime organization changes the sulfur content for for marine transportation yeah. is that so going low to, sulfur fuel gets more expensive it might drive up the cost of, of low sulfur fuel oil yeah, that, yeah. that hawaiian electric uses yeah yeah that, that'll that'll create a problem yep
So, but going back to, I do want to get back to the regulatory environment, but uh, going back to the, the whole thing about costs. So, you know, I'm pretty sure that the cost of, of photovoltaics, notwithstanding the tariff, the tariff is a kind of bump in the road here, you know, the, the Trump tariff against the Chinese. Um, but ultimately, the technology will reduce the cost of photovoltaic and improve the efficiency of, of uh, efficiency of photovoltaic. And likewise for the batteries. I mean, this is coming because there's so much focus on it, so much research going on. So many people around the world are trying to get in on that. So doesn't that mean that biofuels will be priced out? I don't, I don't know if that's necessarily true. And I think there's still a role for the biofuel, uh, for biofuels to play in the system. You, and this is an engineering term that I never fully understood because I'm not an engineer. But um, when, you, when, you, when you go to these variable renewable energy, you lose inertia on the system. This, these old steam units that move slowly, they're not very fast to respond. They're much better in terms of absorbing the, 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 the rapid changes in frequency you get from, from a solar farm. Uh, so they can absorb that. When you don't have that on the system, something else has to make up for the loss of inertia. So, you know, biofuel, biomass has, has a role and will continue to have a role. Because in it's the dispatchable. It's, it's quick. It's, it's not necessarily quick. But it's just firm and steady. You can run it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Just like fossil fuel. Just like a fossil fuel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's mo right now more expensive than a fossil fuel. Mm -hmm. And we've had failures. You know, we've, we've had uh, you know, biofuel projects that have just never came to fruition. Um, that, that's Sharon always going to happen, don't you think? I mean, not every project works. And that's a question of entrepreneurial feasibility and all this. Yeah, it, that's, that's true. And in part because liquid biofuels, the technology isn't quite there yet. You know, we had Inako Pono, they were proposing to use, a, um, what was it called, a microwave depolymerization technology. At dinner, my wife and I speak of little else. <laughs> a giant microwave <laughs> oven taking <laughs> Christmas berry trees and then from that, yeah. uh, cooking it down so there was, to there an there oil. Were issues about that technology. Well, you know, it's it's never been done on a commercial scale. It's been done on a pilot basis. Uh, it it does work, but can can they take it from a pilot scale project to a commercial operation? You know, Inako Pono thought so, um, but I think their their project is shut down. They never got they. Yeah. They, they submitted two applications to the PUC. Both of them were rejected. That was pricing, wasn't it? That was, yeah. It was largely pricing. And I can't say the price because the price was submitted on a confidential basis and that, that hasn't changed. But it was expensive. Mm -hmm. And it, was, it had been submitted at a time when oil was, you know, was about over $100 a barrel. Hmm. So it was still expensive when oil was $100 right, a right. barrel when you consider what it would uh, be really compared to now. Something. Yeah. 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 So regulatory. What okay. was your question? So my question back to is because if there's such a need and it's so important to our economy to have biofuels, why aren't we having more local production? So the question is, I know they have to go through the regulatory process in order to bring it in, in order to produce. So what is, is that, if you can tell us what is the regulatory scheme for doing it and is that the hindrance or is there other, other reasons. Well, you know, if you look at the green energy project, that whole thing started around 2006. They didn't get approval until 2012. Mm. They weren't, they didn't reach commercial operations until 2015. So it took, it took nine years from start to commercial operation. Mm. You know, how can it, a company survive? That yeah, you, you can't blame that all on the regulatory mm. process. Um, I, you know, I really don't know what happened between 2006 and 2011, that why that development process took so long. Um, but some of these projects become very controversial. I mean, look at Huhonua, um, or, or even Aina Pono. You know, the idea of growing your own feedstock on either former uh, sugarcane land or, or land that is now 
um, you know, being taken over by invasive species, whether it's Christmas berry or Albizia trees, to take that land and use it for cultivating some kind of a plant material to either be uh, converted to a biofuel or burned as biomass has become a, a, a real community issue. What um, was the community issue about it? I mean, what, what is the community concerned about such a thing? Well, for example, in the, the Ainakoa Pono project, that was, uh, you know, the, the idea was they were going to develop it in the Ka'u area, uh, you know, south, ha of the Pahala. south of the Big Island. Um, the, a lot, you know, there were a number of community uh, people that didn't want the project. They felt that the land should be used for uh, farming, um, you know, food crops. It was, old, was, it, it was brewer land. It was original brewer plantation land. Right there. That, Bahala, yeah. that goes back before it was uh, Edmund Olson Trust land. Okay. Ed, Ed, Ed Olson owns that land now. Okay. And he was going to lease it to AKP, uh, including the land in which the the uh, the processing plant was going to be. You know. The, and the, you know, the residents didn't like the processing plant. They didn't like the idea of, of uh, trucks taking um, the biofuel from... It's interesting because a lot of those guys were out of work because the plantation had closed. And this would have <laughs> offered them jobs. There were a number so of... They, they were imposing their own jobs. Yeah. The, well, there were a number of people who were in support. It wasn't complete opposition. Yeah. It, but, you know, community... Community outreach becomes an important part of, of developing these types of projects. You got to get out early, win over the community. Got to win over the community, and that's so not only with energy but with everything. That's Look so at true. TMT and all that, you know, and so many other projects. But you know, in terms of the feasibility of it, <clears throat> it seems to me I, I'm going to throw an idea at you because you've been on all sides of this thing. Um, why don't we just leave feasibility up to the banks? In other words, if, if these guys at Anacoa Pono or any other project, if they can get a bank loan to cover the capital investment required by the project. And the banker, he's going to look carefully, he doesn't want to lose money. Uh, the banker says, yes, we'll loan you the money. Isn't, isn't that a sufficient statement of feasibility? Oh, that's a <laughs> tough question, Jay. <laughs> you know, you're, you're asking me, should the, sh should, we be should the PUC be approving projects that have not reached commercial scale in other parts of the, the world? Um, you know, that, that's a tough question. And, you know, w when I was the consumer advocate, uh, you know, I thought the Aina Pono contracts should have been approved. I, I submitted testimony to support both projects. I recommended that the commission approve, and the commission disagreed. Well, you know, I mean, it goes to Sharon's point, and I think we, we need to at least wrap a little on this in the le next two minutes in our show, is that how can we make the, the gauntlet easier. And I understand, I think we all have to understand that if, if the people out there in the community oppose it, that's going to be resistance that takes time to resolve if it's resolvable at all. But that's not the only reason that the PUC or the regulators, you know, slow things down and take, what, five years in that case, um, and sometimes more. And it's not just energy, it's everything in a way. There's an article uh, about, uh, by Gene Park, in the Washington Post a week ago, where he, he talked about um, you know, the problem with the false alarm and how Hawaii government can't seem to get anything done and Hawaii is really special. This is in the Washington Post. This is not a good statement of how things, of how things go in Hawaii. I mean, can we do something to make it faster? Can we have a regulatory process that makes it easier, may I say, for a developer to develop? Sure. I mean, uh, one of the problems we have is that developers spend millions of dollars in the development process. Um, they get to the point where they even have a contract with Hawaiian Electric. And then they got, have to go. So you think, well, you've reached such a major hurdle. You finally have convinced the utility that your project is priced appropriately, uh, fits into their, into their system. And then you've got to go and, and, and go through the regulatory approval in front of the PUC, and that can take a year. And, and then you can have your project rejected. Uh, it happened to a number of the solar projects. Um, Ho'ohana was one. Uh, Nextera had, had proposed a, a solar project out mm -hmm. in Wyoming. Right. Apart that, from their acquisition of the... Uh, that, exactly. Uh, and that was rejected as well. 
and, and both developers had spent a lot of money in the millions of dollars only to find out that the PUC was going to reject their project. And, you know, we, so we need to get rid of some of that development risk, that regulatory risk, so that if we have a, an approved power supply improvement plan and say a biomass project is in the power supply improvement plan and it's been approved by the, the, the commission, and you price your project according to this, the, what, what the power supply improvement plan says, and you have a contract with HECO, it should be an easy process. It should to be get a slam dunk at that point. All be able the ducks to, are in a row. Should be able to get easy regulatory But approval. it's not so. Not so. Hmm. So how, how, what, what are the, what can you do? Is it like a major overhaul? Are there tweaks? Or is it, you know, shorten the time frame? Or, or wh what can you do? Or we're going to be it's kind of stymied to the future, way into the future? Well, you know, the commission. No pressure on this. Well, yeah. And, <laughs> And I've got to appear before the commission, so I have to be careful what I say. Um, Carefully state what we should do. <laughs> you know, the, the commission does, does a great job, and so does the consumer advocate. You know, and I'm not talking about when I was there. I mean, Dean Nishina is the consumer advocate. He does a wonderful job protecting the interests of consumers. But, but we need to have a power supply improvement plan that's not just accepted by the commission. We need to have one that's approved by the commission so that we have a certain amount of certainty that my project, my client's project, is in the power supply improvement plan, fits within the parameters of that plan. So I have a reasonable expectation that that project, mm. if I can get a contract with the, with the utility, is going to get approved. And there it is. And, and as a result, the banks will be easier, right? Um, and the entrepreneurs will be more confident, and uh, it won't be completely risk capital. It'll be a, a, ma a manageable risk. So um, how do you make that change? Is that a statutory thing, Jeff? Is that something the PUC could decide tonight between cocktails? Uh, you know, how serious would, how, what effort would it take to make that change? Well, I, think, I think it would take a, somewhat of a change of philosophy in the, at the PUC. Um, you know, at some point, we need to say, you know, the risk should fall on all of us on, on moving toward renewable energy, and you know, we will have some projects that aren't going to that aren't going to come to fruition. We're going to have some projects that are going to fail. Um, it's just the nature of development and democracy. Yep. So, so if it is in the plan, once you get um, a PPA agreed upon by the utility and the developer or the, the vendor, then it has to come back to the PUC again, doesn't it? Yes. So is there any way to say within certain parameters or, or you know, if, if you have this approved plan, you know, go forward, do it, you know, instead of so having So it's to one back. iteration instead yeah, of multiple like iterations. Yeah, coming back every time right. you get a developer yeah. and in. And the answer, Jeff? I, I, I agree with Sharon. I mean, that's... To me, that's the way the process should work. Let, let's have a plan. Let's get everyone on board with it. Let's approve that plan, and then and then move Just forward. Execute. And, and so yeah, people can rely then, on that approval. Right. And now we have now now if if, if there's if there's for example, um, you know, we're looking for so many gallons of biofuel. Okay. Now we, we say we want one million gallons of biofuel per year on Oahu. Go ahead, developers. Uh, here's the price. Come in, you guys all bid. Mm -hmm. Right, and that's the last thing they have to say. Mm -hmm. And it, then it should be an right. easy, done deal. easy approval. And likewise, this show is a done deal because <laughs> we're we're out of time. <laughs> Jeff, oh, it's so no. nice to spend the time with you. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Sharon, thank you so much. And let me well, say happy Valentine's happy Day, Valentine's you guys. Happy Valentine's Day. 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 Take care, Day. 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 <laughs> Thanks And we'll be much. back with Jeff. We'll be back with more more biofuel next more week. Biofuel. <laughs> next week is Joel and Carl speaking on uh, aviation. Oh, Bye. aviation. Okay. 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 All They'll right. be taking over the show. Good night, Sharon. <laughs> Good night, Jay. Thank you.